I'm a William Kern professor here at IRT, and uh, I bring speakers in that I think might contribute to the campus intellectual life occasionally. Uh, and I'm very happy that Rachel Andrews from George Eastman Museum is here today. I heard her give a talk on Colorama, which you'll learn much more about, uh, a couple months ago, and I thought, wow, I really enjoyed it. And I thought, wow, that'd be a great talk for my students and colleagues at RIT. So I invited her down, and I'm very happy to have her here today to, to give her talk on Colorama. It's interesting, my first year here teaching was 2010, and the Colorama exhibit was up at the George Eastman House, which it was called at the time. And so I took my class there. The, Eastman, the museum was open late on Thursday nights, which it no longer is. Anyway, I took my students there, and I was discoursing and talking about enthusiastically about Colorama. It made a great introduction to my class, for the students, at least I saw, thought so. And I was in the gallery, and this gentleman raised his hand and said, excuse me. And I said, yes. I knew he wasn't one of my students. He said, can I say something? And I said, sure. And he said, oh, I work for Kodak. And I actually did some work on the Colorado Project. And I said, yeah, come on up. So I brought him up, and he proceeded to talk to my students for about 15 minutes. And I thought that, that was just a great introduction for me to this world of photography, Kodak, George Eastman Museum, and teaching about things strategic and visual. Uh, so I'm very happy to have Rachel here today. Uh, she's contributed an essay to a new book on Colorama. I have an old booklet, or an older booklet on Colorama, that was put out by the museum, which I'll pass around. And on the back, this has this famous Colorama of five water skiers. This is very important to me and my family because Right around that year, 1968 or so, my family sent out a Christmas card picture with all five of us Schroeders skiing. I was very little at the time, but I could ski. And uh, when I saw this Colorama, I cracked up. I said, oh my god, my parents must have seen that in an advertisement or something and copied it. So I always like, I'm going to write, one day I'm going to write an essay about the Colorama water skiers and the Schroeder water skiers from the late 60s. I'll pass this around and leave it to Rachel. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, again, my name is Rachel Andrews. I'm the Assistant Collection Manager at the George Eastman Museum, not too far from here. Um, if you have any questions later about what Assistant Collection Manager means, I'd be more than happy to talk about that. Um, but right now I'm going to talk about the uh, Kodak Colorama Advertising Campaign. So the Colorama, designed by the Eastman Kodak Company, was one of the longest and most successful corporate advertising campaigns of the 20th century. The Colorama images were massive, backlit transparencies displayed primarily on the east balcony wall of New York City's uh, Grand Central Terminal. These billboard-sized transparencies were designed to demonstrate the brilliance of color photography and to advertise Kodak's color film products to a mass market. The campaign began in 1950 and lasted through 1990. During this time, a new Colorama was installed every few weeks, resulting in a total of 565 transparencies displayed throughout four decades. How did the Colorama advertising campaign begin? Well, to discuss this, we have to go back to 1892, when George Eastman, the founder of Eastman Kodak Company, uh, formerly, formerly known as the Eastman Dry Plate and Film Company, created Kodak's advertising department. The goal of this department was to make the company the largest manufacturer of photographic supplies in the world by strategically marketing and advertising the company's materials to amateur photographers. Eastman believed that the powerful promotion believed that powerful promotion was essential to achieving this goal. It's believed that the company had one of the largest advertising budgets in the world at the time. Why was Eastman interested in focusing on the amateur market? In 1888, a uh, half century before the conception of the Colorama, the Eastman Kodak Company introduced a camera that uh, allowed a person of any skill level to create photographs. An example of this Kodak camera is on the left side of the screen here. These cameras established the concept of the snapshot, and I'll discuss the snapshot aesthetic a little bit more later. Um, it's 
mimicked in the coloramas later. <clears throat> the Kodak camera slogan was, you press the button, we do the rest, which communicated the new simplicity and um, accessibility of photography. Prior to these new snapshot cameras, photography was a medium that was very expensive and labor intensive. While the Kodak camera was easy to use, it was still fairly costly for the average consumer. Later Kodak camera models had lower prices, which increased popularity. Such camera models included the Brownie camera, an example of which is on the right hand side of your screen here, and that was introduced in 1900. Uh, the $1 Brownie camera finally made snapshot photography more accessible um, and therefore it put more easy to use cameras into the hands of everyday consumers. It also became fashionable to record one's everyday life because it was more accessible. Once it was trendy to take these snapshots of everyday life, the opportunities for using snapshot cameras multiplied. The combination of low prices, increased production, the continual development of new products and an aggressive advertising strategy allowed Kodak to dominate the market for photographic materials for much of the 20th century. To market and advertise to large numbers of people, Kodak developed traveling trade shows and set up booths at World's Fairs. These elaborate setups were intended to create a memorable experience for visitors while publicizing the company's latest products. In 1939, when black and white snapshot photography was commonplace, Kodak used the New York World's Fair to promote their color products for amateur photographers. A Kodak color film marketed towards the general public, Kodachrome, was released in 1936. The film fit all standard small camera formats and could be exposed in available light, just like black and white snapshots. Yet the film and paper were still expensive for the average consumer, the 1939 World's Fair served as a platform for Kodak to promote photochrome materials and to create excitement over color photography. The highlight of this pavilion was the first fully automated widescreen color slideshow called the Cavalcade of Color. And an example of this is on the top of the screen here. Um, <clears throat> this was about 22 feet tall by 122 feet or 20 something. I don't remember the exact number. It was a massive, massive projection. Um, and then on the bottom of the screen here is the outside of the, uh, the building that Kodak had at the 1939 World's Fair. The show consisted of pre-recorded commentary and musical accompaniment, synchronized with 2,112 projected Kodachrome's color slides, which were enlarged 50,000 times onto this uh, giant semicircular screen. The slideshow exhibited the vast subject matter that could be captured with Kodachrome color film, while suggesting the necessity to capture the significant moments in one's life. The discourse of the soundtrack was patriotic, emphasizing domesticity um, and citizenship. The cavalcade of color was viewed by 4 million visitors annually, endorsing the brilliance of color photography on a grand scale. In an economy struggling to reform after the stock market crash of 1929, Kodak wanted to promote the idea that every purchase was an act of citizenship and every moment could be even better if captured in Kodak Color. By the 1940s, photographic manufacturers were working on developing more affordable and accessible negative to positive uh, color products. Factory processed Coda color film and paper was introduced in the early 1940s, and in the later part of that decade, the company had started working on user processed active color film, color film, excuse me, on paper. It wasn't until the post World War II economic boom when color photography was finally mass produced. When Kodak launched the Colorama in 1950, color materials were only 2% of the company's sales. The Colorama advertising campaign, in co a combination with the release of affordable color film and paper, finally allowed color to overtake black and white materials in the amateur photographic market. It was during this time of post-war prosperity, as the affluence of the middle class was growing, that Kodak seized the opportunity to market color photography to a broad consumer base in New York City. 
A decline in railroad travel prompted the New York Central Railroad to offer the East Balcony advertising space to Kodak in 1949. Knowing Kodak had been seeking an advertising location in New York City, the high visibility location inside the terminal um, had previously been used for advertisements since 1941 when the Farm Security Administration blacked out the uh, east windows to display a uh, black and white photographic montage promoting the war bonds, as you can see on the screen here. After the war, the east balcony wall was a large blank canvas. Kodak staff had to design a format that could efficiently utilize the east balcony space while effectively marketing color photography. Because of the previous success with the Cavalcade of Color uh, slideshow, the Kodak Advertising Department's first thought was to project 35 millimeter uh, Kodachrome slides onto the East Balcony wall. However, the terminal was not dark enough for projection, um, so the idea was born to enlarge and illuminate color transparencies from behind. This was an innovative concept at the time, so the technology needed to photograph, develop, print, and display these massive coloramas was developed by Kodak specifically for this colorama advertising campaign. The first colorama debuted on the East Balcony Mall um, on May 15, 1915. 1915. Uh, these first iterations were made with three separate exposures, which were then assembled onto one giant transparency. The central transparency measured 36 feet wide, while the two transparencies flanking the central image were both 12 feet wide. 8x10 and 4x5 cameras were used to capture these first coloramas. The film could be enlarged up to 50 times the original size without losing details. In order to produce a full panoramic image from a single exposure, the colorama photographers started using an old Deardorff Banquet camera that held 8x20 film. This format earned the Colorama's famed slogan of the world's largest photograph. A custom-built enlarger was designed to print smaller sections of each Colorama transparency onto 19 and a half inch wide by 20 foot long Ectacolor print film, so it was these long strips. Each section had to be evenly uh, exposed in the enlarger and developed in the dark room to produce a very consistent tone across the transparency so that any subtle changes in the chemistry weren't noticeable between each panel. An unfinished swimming pool at the Kodak Employee Recreation Center was sometimes used to dry the large transparencies overnight. There was a myth that it was used to develop and you know, do everything, it's not true. Um, but until uh, 1963, it was used to sometimes hang the transparencies. Um, but in 1963, a viscous uh, chemistry pr uh, processor was introduced. Um, and that processor uh, eliminated the need to hang the prints to dry, and it also eradicated the problem of any inconsistent chemistry. So 41 sections were assembled with transparent tape to make the 18 foot tall by 60 foot wide panorama. With techno technological improvements, the width of each panel increased, requiring only 20 sections to be spliced together. And then during the last three years of the Colorama campaign, the panels increased to uh, six feet wide. Once assembled, the transparencies were retouched and then trimmed. The final product was rolled onto a 20-foot long metal spool before being driven to New York City. Every three to five weeks, a new Colorama arrived in Manhattan before rush hour and was installed over 5,200 linear feet of cold cathode tubing, which produced 61,000 watts of light. As the Colorama advertising campaign gained momentum and affordable negative to positive color uh, products were released to the public, color materials for the first time overtook black and white in the amateur photographic market. Each Colorama image was designed to create the impression that the average viewer could capture the same photograph by using Kodak photographic materials, of course. Of the 565 transparencies displayed at Grand Central Terminal, 
Most were taken by Kodak staff photographers, such as Neil Montanus, whose image is on the top of the screen here, and Herbert Archer, on the bottom. Lee Howick was another Kodak staff photographer, as well as Mormon Kerr. Other well-known contributing photographers include Ansel Adams, who's on the top, and Aubrey Sweet. Many of the advertising images featured a person posed with a Kodak camera or in the act of taking a photograph. Before the full panoramic format of the colorama, the two sidebar images uh, often displayed snapshots that could have been taken by the central picture taker. Um, this reinforced the idea that anyone with a Kodak camera uh, could create colorful scenes like those seen in these billboard sized photographs. The coloramas, however, were anything but spontane spontaneous snapshots. Some of the more elaborate shoots, uh, such as this underwater scene in colorama number 335, required months of planning. Stage scenarios were disguised as real life promoting a product design to capture and preserve everyday moments. Kodak's use of the snapshot aesthetic made the colorama's idealized imagery seem achievable to consumers, and inserting a camera into the scene allowed viewers to imagine themselves on location holding a Kodak camera, ready to capture the moment. Kodak's marketing campaign aimed to make snap shooting imperative to preserving memories of one's life. The same goal the company had with the original Kodak camera. The consumer could then curate their snapshot albums, making sure to include the happiest of moments, just like the perfect scenes in these advertisements. In post-World War II America, Kodak relied on nostalgic and sentimental imagery to sell products. The advertising department created scenes representing traditional American holidays and ideal vacations. Such images presented the affluent, white, patriarchal, nuclear family as the standard of American culture. Despite the socioeconomic and sociocultural changes that occurred between 1950 and 1990, the Colorama's imagery remained largely unchanged, invariably celebrating this family model. Only in the later years of the advertising campaign was there a shift towards more exotic locations a few, and fewer tra uh, traditional domestic scenes. These faraway lands promoted wealth and travel as desirable commodities that the consumer could experience best while using Kodak color <coughs> photographic products. Long after the post-World War II economic boom, Kodak continued to perpetuate the colorful, romanticized world that they had imagined specifically for the Colorama. The Kodak Colorama advertising campaign ended in 1990 as the Grand Central Terminal was preparing for renovations that would restore the original architectural integrity to the building. Today, the East Balcony is home to an Apple store. Um, you may see the little Apple logos there. There's three of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, though each trans giant transparency was destroyed after display, the original materials used the, to create the coloramas remain preserved at the Georgie Museum. Uh, in June of uh, 2010, the colorama archive was donated by Kodak to the Georgie Museum. Um, this is the format in which the coloramas exist today. It's not so glamorous. Um, the archive consists of source material related to the campaign, including photographic objects, related paper documents. Um, and again, because uh, each colorama was destroyed after display, there are no finished uh, standalone works in our collection. Instead, this archival material presents information relating to the creation and the history of the colorama displays, including the negatives and transparencies which were used to create the original displays. There are also black and white and color reference prints for us to refer to. Our current graduate student named Sarah Brody, um, who is in the Photographic Preservation and Collections Management Program with, uh, with U of R and our museum, is working on fully processing um, this archive to make the related materials more, uh, better preserved physically and more accessible intellectually. 
Um, there doesn't appear to be any other public resource that provides information about all 565 coloramas in one place. So it's our hope that her appendix um, will be a valuable resource to better understanding and accessing the scope of the advertising campaign. Um, we expect a uh, finding aid, a fully illustrated finding aid to be available um, somewhere around May of this year um, if you wish to conduct further research on these materials. I've got the library um, contact here. Um, and there's my contact information. Happy to answer any questions about the campaign. Yes. Well, um, question: When it comes to creating like the like visual content, you know, for a campaign, how important is it to really like you know set the image or like you know already have like pre-prepared like kind of like a set from like a movie? Yeah, they are sets like from a movie. I. Um, from what I understand, they had sets in the Kodak, you know, building, um, and where they did a lot of, um, you know, uh, brainstorming, and they set up these scenes. I mean, these are all, all staged. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything is planned right down to what everyone's wearing, and, you know, how they're holding the chair, yeah. you know. So I would say it's extremely important. Because I was looking through the book, and I was seeing, like, even, like, the ones with the like in, in the water, you can kind of tell how staged they were, how like sure. staged the whole background was. So I was trying to figure out what was the process of them like thinking of that, you know, having coming up with that particular image and then trying to you know replicate what they had in their mind to you know basically go go, yeah. go forward with their strategy. But. Um, I don't know intimately um, what their whole working process was, but um, they did, like I said, have a they had a huge budget for having yeah. the department. So if they dreamt it, they wanted to do it. You know, they, they were able to travel to the West in some of these images and you know, put on these big uh, big shows and have yeah. the lights and the camera, uh, you know, everything they had set up just the way that they wanted it. Um, I know that a lot of, they took a lot more photographs than what ended up being displayed. Yeah, yeah I understand. Yeah. yeah it, it probably is expensive. Yeah. Yes. Um, I know, like, <clears throat> towards the beginning of the presentation, you showed us, like, the camera that was cost a dollar for the cheap one. I'm wondering if there was anything before that that really existed to support, like, prosumerism? The, uh, the Kodak camera on the same screen there um, was the first uh, camera that was targeted specifically toward amateur photographers. It came preloaded with, it was a paperback film at the time, um, 100 exposures. So uh, the consumer bought that camera and you know just had to hit the button and turn the knob and then it would you had a hundred and you put it in the mailbox, ship it back to Kodak. They would um, develop, print them, and then send it all back to you. Oh um, so that was the first time that that was really accessible to amateur photographers. That one was a little bit more expensive than that Brownie camera in 1900, um, but that's really really what propelled amateur photography. In the late, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, Mr. Kirkley, the uh, iconic images in those displays are not of like Soviet people's art, but exactly <laughs> the same kind of gigantic representations of an idealized Soviet world. Sure. And later Obama does the same thing. Big public displays of how the world they're trying to create should look. Exactly. Although this was done by private enterprise rather than by state authority. Right, yeah, that's a great comparison. Yeah. A technical, a little tiny thing. When we were making these strips mm -hmm. in, this, in that assembly, mm -hmm. were they vertical or horizontal? I didn't My know. understanding is, yeah, they were um, 19 and a half inches wide by uh, 28 tall. So they were um, long strips. So this was the, I believe it was printed for it perfectly, yes. When I took my students, my, my RIT students there in 2010, I think one of the things that the students felt is that the images from a, from a lens of a, like a retro appeal, most of these images could still work, but they thought that by including the camera in the coloramas, that, that looked stagey, that looked fakey, and that really identified the, the photographs as older. 
And but they said, you know, if you took out the person who was posing with the camera, often an Instamatic camera in the, in the 60s, that image could work today. Uh, and I thought that was a really interesting observation. You know, as we look, you know, thinking about this as social realism or, you know, evidence of a, a way of life, that was the one thing my students said doesn't work in when 2010. Oh, you'd have to do the cell phone. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was thinking. They're all yeah. oh, exactly. <laughs> and no, and there's an Apple app that I use in my teaching that, that does that. You know, it's a little bit more snapshotty, but it has a young woman in a car with a cell phone. And I like that as an example because it has three of the great inventions of the 20th century transportation, photography, cell phone, computer, and cell phone. Yes. So are the images that you have here, they've obviously been digitized, and they've been digitized in like a super high resolution. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I was wondering that because they're too clear for them to be that old. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so if you um, went to like Cowboys Stadium that has a 120 foot long TV screen, mm -hmm. you could see what that would look like on that size. Sure, yeah, I mean, uh, so the transparencies that we have at the museum today, um, you know, are approximately the 18 by 20 inch um, transparencies. And so our staff photographer has either um, scanned or photographed them depending on the condition of these. Um, some of them, uh, you can't tell now, but you, I'm sure you notice like some of them are a little bit more washed out or the colors look a little bit off and that's just inherent to the color materials. Um, so she does, has done her best to try and replicate what they might have been with that specific um, uh, technology at the time. Um, so there's always a little bit of um, subjectivity to what we see today, um, just because those transparencies don't exist, the originals. Um, but yeah, these are uh, very high resolution digital images that we used for the book um, that I wrote the essay in, which I forgot to bring. Um, but yeah, and so we're, we're working someday to have all of that digitized. It's a big project. Yeah. <laughs> Just a quick question, kind of a little off topic. But what was the megapixels of? I'm not even sure if you had megapixels back in the day. Yeah, no. <laughs> I know, like, you know, today we have like our smartphones, they usually come with, like five megapixels, eight megapixels, some of them like 12. Like, what yeah. would their scale be back in the day? Right. So originally um, they started photographing on 8x10 or 4x5 cameras. So the film would have been, you know, 4x5 inches or 8x10. The larger the transparency or negative, um, the more information you could get when you blow it up, right? So as opposed to blowing up an image that's this small, you're blowing up something like that. Um, later technologies allowed um, transparencies and negatives to get smaller and to still enlarge them. I think it was 50,000 times uh, or something. 50, uh, yeah. Originally 50, and then it was like 50, you know, I forget what it, you know, the numbers. but. Uh, the 1977, I believe, they started using 35 millimeter um, slides. So the small, I don't know if you've seen oh, the yeah. little slides with the paper around it. Yeah, yeah. Um, they could use those uh, to create 18 by 60 foot, uh, you know, big transparency. Without losing the detail. Without losing the detail. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm sure our, you know, uh, digital minds of today would find that it's not quite as crisp and clear as something that we, you know, would take on a, you know, big fancy digital camera today, but... If you're seeing it from the floor of Grand Central, mm -hmm. the fact that all the dots are close together doesn't make sense. Exactly. Right. The same as, the, you know, people didn't see the little transparent tape that they used to splice the, the, uh, the, sl the slots together. We need to talk about grain size instead of pixel size. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I have a question that I, I think particularly relevant for my students. How did you, as an archivist researcher, think about your contribution to this larger Colorama project? So, you know, I'm asking my students to articulate what's new about their project that they're going to do for me? What's their contribution? What's their distinctive perspective? Mm -hmm. how, how would you answer that? I, 
I approached this research and essay um, having already known a little bit of what had been written about uh, the Coloramas within, you know, within the 10 years uh, span. Um, and a lot of it had to do with technical um, you know, prowess and what went on exactly at Kodak because we're in Rochester and that's the histories that we have. We have these histories from people who worked there and you know, either took the photographs or developed them or you know, were part of the advertising team. So um, that story I felt had kind of been told. Um, and so I wanted to, to kind of dive a little deeper into what the campaign meant. Um, my essay isn't extremely long. I, I kind of wanted to, but you know, uh, book projects have timelines. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, the images are they're so nostalgic uh, and sentimental, and it's you know why was kind of how I approached them. Why are they sentimental? Um, that's not what my I grew up in. You know, I didn't grow up in the '60s, um, but it's kind of this resounding imagery. And even though I didn't walk through Grand Central Terminal every day, what do those images mean to the modern viewer? And what you know, what uh, did the Kodak company like? Why did they decide to do this advertising campaign? I didn't get too many answers. <laughs> you know, I was just kind of uh, diving into. Uh, the history um, and the facts, rather than um, you know any kind of flowery um, you know reminiscence about an image because I didn't I don't have that. Yeah. Um, I see in these two eras. There's the Norman Rockwell era, and that's got some pokey qualities to it. But if you and all I've seen of what you've shown. If you switch to the later ones, I'd call yes. that the National Geographic era. Absolutely. Which has got a ton of quality to it. Absolutely. But that family in the convertible on vacation was very, I, nobody can look at that and say that it's in 1950. Yeah. I mean, there's a hokey 50 Rockwell quality about the girl stuff. Absolutely. Only hokey to us now. Not to me, I would oh, say yeah. that. <laughs> Not hokey at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I think that's one thing that you've done too, is you've, pulled, you've put the story of the Colorama as an advertising campaign a little bit to the fore. You know, and it's a complex topic because it's, it's photography, it's technology, but I think at the heart it's, it's marketing, it's strategic communication. Mm -hmm. And yet, because it was such a prominent project, it becomes more than just advertising. And I think that's that's kind of an interesting thing to try to think about. And you know, I certainly want my students to think about how those photographs and that, those campaigns function both as advertising but also kind of cultural representations. Because in some ways, there, there's some deep interest in Kodak advertising, but because they're so diminished and because we just don't have that kind of photography as much anymore, it's almost as if the interest in these kind of campaigns, and particularly Kodak's campaigns, as cultural representation, as kind of cultural objects, what did they say about the culture, not just of Kodak and Rochester, but you know, this was really seen as a nationwide and even a, a global advertising campaign. That said a lot about photography, and I think those are the kind of questions that, that your presentation really brings up to, for us to think about. Of what is it about? Rachel said that there was this. There's a there's a show of the Colorado that's traveling around, and it's in Albany now. And Rachel told me that there was quite a negative review in the Albany newspaper that called out the Colorado for not having very much diversity in their images. And so that's an interesting. How do we judge a campaign that ran from 1950 to 1990 with today's identity politics? You know, and in some sense, Kodak can tell a story that they did include African Americans in this campaign fairly early, and they they were criticized for it. You know, the now we call them the alt right criticized Kodak for daring to include African Americans and and whites in the same photograph in the same colorama. You know that 
that was the time of, that was the, the tenor of the times. And so that's another kind of interesting project to try to understand. Yeah, this was a very white suburban, and as Rachel mentioned, kind of a, a nuclear family image of America. And certainly, certainly that, that's something to think about. How did photography, not just Kodak and not just the Colorama, how did photography kind of set up expectations of what family life or what American life should be like? And I think those are the questions that, that studying Kodak and Rachel's project really help us understand. You know, the role of photography and marketing in helping us imagine what it is to live a, a life or a happy life or a celebrated life, a life worth celebrating. And obviously, the way Instagram works today is quite different. And the way we think about photographing our lives has changed quite a bit. But I think we could argue, and I think Rachel would argue too, that Kodak really set a lot of the patterns about the way we think about how photography works, both as a family activity, personal activity, but also as a strategic communication activity. So, you know, these, these are, first and foremost, in my mind, strategic communication tools to sell Kodak and film. We do want to see a couple of examples today. Watch any ad on television at 6 o'clock. You think 50% of Americans lived in biracial couples. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there, that has got the same impact. That, yeah. Yeah, the landscape of identity and the way that the, the world of advertising and photography thinks about what is, what is a family has evolved. I mean, I, I think that's a way to say about it. It's just evolved. That, that I think the reality is not everyone lives in this nuclear family, you know, dad, mom, two, three kids, then or now. And so that's another question that, that I think is worth thinking about. How does photography, but also advertising photography, I don't know, does it reflect it? Does it shape it? Does it manipulate it? Does it appropriate it? You know, these, these issues I think are, are continue to at least animate my interest in advertising photography. I kind of find it interesting to see how just advertising in general has evolved. I mean, this was kind of cutting edge back in, in the day, but now, you know, it would be it would be just unbelievable that that little camera can take that picture next to it. Mm -hmm. But but because it was so new, people bought it. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. Extraordinary it's hard to sell these days. <laughs> people are people who have learned more, I guess. Well, I think what is what is proper to take photographs of has just expanded so much. You know, we, we talk a lot in my class about Instagram and YouTube, you know, so there's I mean one of my favorite genres of this YouTube world is people eating their food, you know, just <laughs> you, you never see such a mundane thing in the Colorama, and yet now, you know, our Instagram and YouTube feeds are full of just people doing very, very everyday things. Spectacular things, too, but I think it's interesting to contrast this with the Colorama, which generally was staged, as we've all talked about, and also rather spectacular for the most part, or at least kind of memorable. Whereas at least my Instagram feed is not always memorable. <laughs> Any other connections or questions? I enjoyed your presentation and, and the story of the advertising part of it really resonated. It tend to be a little bit skeptical, anyways. I always look at advertising with a jaded eye and said, what is that really possible? Mm -hmm. You know, so just to see that that these worked and sold so many cameras and so many, so much film. Yeah. Uh, they certainly helped with the lower, lower prices for color materials. Yeah. And I think you see the interesting transition from the fifties as we talked about this kind of nostalgic vision of the Rockwell Americana, but also showing the act of taking a photograph 
to the 80s and 90s where they, they, the camera began to disappear. You just had these beautiful vistas that we saw the Taj Mahal. Um, and I think that, that little detail, I mean, for, for students out there, that kind of detail would be a really powerful kind of focus on how the general world of advertising photography changed uh, in, over the course of the 20th century. This is a great example of part of that story. I actually like when you mentioned like what like message is like the photography telling you. Um, yeah. I feel like that's very important because you know an image does say a thousand words, and then especially when you're trying to you know compare that to a brand and what message that they're trying to send out, you have to be very patient with what you allow in your photo, even like the the details of like what angle you do the photo, because you don't want to seem like you're trying to be better than everybody, so you can't really use the God angle that you really can. It's just a lot of things that you have to look into when you're trying to present a message that's supposed to relate to your brand. And then it's just like, well, what is the, what are most photographers, like what is one of the most photographs showing today? And that's very relevant. You know, I, I agree with you, that's relevant for back in the day, that's relevant for now, because we're in such a visual driven um, time right now where visual content is so important with not only just businesses, but which is just people in general within branding themselves, it's important to kind of show the right light. Yeah. And I just wanted to just, you know, tell you I agree with what you said, so. Yeah. Also, like a specific audience that you're trying to right. reach. Right, and what's going to appeal to them, you know. I think it's going to be really interesting, you know, in another 40 or 50 years, what you see um, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, what, what are the images that right. are available compared to what's out there now. It, it's going to be another huge change. It might turn out to be 3D. Um, <laughs> I mean, honestly, if we're looking at what's going on today, we have holographic um, concerts right now. We have, well, I mean, you know, VR, concert. AR. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, as we evolve, you know, of course, the technology will as well. As well. We're not going to just be looking at 2D images anymore. We really are going to be looking at 3D images, maybe 4D images, stuff that's really popping out, coming to life. So it's like, what is that going to tell people? How are we going to perceive that? Is are we going to perceive that as, oh my God, evolution? Or are we going to perceive it as threatening to our own existence and to like what we perceive as real? So it's just kind of like, it can make you think in like so many different realms, like retro futurism, and it, it kind of do like, it, you can go all over the place with that. But the message itself of like what we can perceive and like how we feel about it, like not even just like the off the base value, but just like how we feel emotionally. Like, are people ready for that? Are people ready for the change for the next level? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think that the technical impact of the early days can't be underestimated. Nobody else could do anything like that. Nobody could see anything like that on that scale. Just walking in there and seeing that um, and knowing that it existed and said, Kodak is the technical leader, nobody else in the world can do this. You know, it kind of put all of their expertise right out in front of everybody. Um, and it was very subliminal. You didn't even necessarily know that you were in awe. You just were. Um, but then as you, know, you get into the late 50s and 60s and television comes in, then there's other kind of displays, and those are crappy, you know. Um, but they started to catch up, um, and, and so on. So I think it became less of we own pictures. We're, we're the best at anything we want to do with pictures. Well, now other people started to be good with pictures. So then Kodak's role or dominance in that area starts to slip away, and there's other people coming in that are players. In that. But that, I think that's a very important point, that the Colorama was a, a tangible, physical demonstration of technological prowess. And Kodak didn't need to say, the Colorama is constructed by you know, these strips, and it's taken by this camera. They didn't need to. It was just the physical form demonstrated the technological prowess. So that's another, you know, again, a lesson in, in terms of this kind of visual communication that by choosing such a spectacular format, Kodak could rely on the visual more than the verbal. And that location. If you went to the stadium and saw a giant screen TV now, there's, there's two things. You're looking at, oh, who made the giant TV made screen? screen yeah. Yeah. Okay, that may be impressive. But the image could be done by anybody, and you don't know. So, you know. There's no message that's instantly given just by looking at the image. 
which is not a good point. Yeah. Yeah. A lesser point on the image switch from Rockwell. Uh, the viewer may not realize it, but there's a lot of uh, impressionistic visualization in the later shots. I mean, some look like Matisse colors. Yeah. That's the, the people who were doing it back home. That wasn't the accident. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that suggests the society is moving away from literalism yeah. to a less highly defined kind of scene. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did they have any old shots of um, visual content of just words? Um, like, you know, they're trying to use words as, you know, not only as, you know, but like as photography, of course, but, you know, yeah. just to kind of like get another message out. They incorporated words in some of them, um, but it, um, not exclusively uh, words. Um, there were a couple that were advertising something else that were advertising, I think it's Chrome Spun was like a, a bathing suit line or something. So you got these Oh, yeah, there was a couple that, that yeah. were kind of co branded yeah, yeah, exactly. Not, not, not many, yeah. Um, there was that one, so it had a you know a little spiel about chrome span mm -hmm. spun on the side, like a little box. I was um, wondering if that wasn't an experiment to see how it feels. Yeah, I don't know. There were a couple though, and there was one advertising. I think it was a golf tournament. It's uh, yeah, and so it had like the, the title of the the date, um, and then there was one for the the moon. Uh, they landed on the moon. They did one um, for that, and so it was kind of this grainy, blurry picture of a TV screen, kind of that they took and blew up, and then they have um, a couple, uh, you know, a brief sentence yeah. on there. Uh, very minimal for text. Yeah. Because I know captioning could be very, you know, yeah. it, could, it could determine how somebody looks at an image anyway. Like, sure. they try to do that, or, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.